Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. This quote from Carl Jung serves as the thesis for Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley. It's an extremely important idea and one that we don't see confronted in cinema that often. Only superb writing and acting can portray the subtleties of the idea properly, but Nightmare Alley is more than up for the task. To understand the main character Stan and his ginormous character arc, we need to keep Young's wisdom in the back of our mind because it is Stan's inability to recognize this truth until the film's very last shot that causes him to burn his entire life and the lives of those who interact with him to the ground. Stan's arc is perfectly established in the opening scene. We are introduced to a man who's desperately trying to escape his past. We see him store a body under the floorboards of a house, and then he burns it to the ground. The scene visualizes what is happening inside Stan's mind. He is repressing the destructive feelings that his father has instilled in him, feelings of pain, resentment, and most importantly, a feeling of deep inferiority. Later in the film, Stan says that he blames his father for his mother leaving, but deep down, Stan feels culpability. By stitching blame to his father, he feels he can escape that feeling of abandonment by burning the entire quilt, if you will. But again, the feelings are not eliminated by his father's murder, they're only repressed. When Stan heads off with his entire family now dead, he is primed for destruction. He is a time bomb, to quote Mike from Breaking Bad. And he's a time bomb for the same reason Walter White was. He is not conscious of his deepest desires. His mind is all smoke and mirrors. And mirrors are a constant visual motif in the film, being a symbol of self-identity and self-knowledge. Stan winds up finding a home with a traveling carnival, and no place could be worse for Stan. The entire culture is cheap tricks and deception. It's a swindler's paradise. So the self-deceptive pathogen inside Stan finds the ideal temperature to survive and grow. The first act Stan encounters at the carnival is a geek show, an act where a man who has been mentally shattered by alcohol or drugs does acts of insanity to entertain the audience. The man who runs the show, Clem, tells Stan that the reason people pay to watch a fellow human degrade themselves is to get a shot of the, at least I'm not that guy drug. They want to feel good about themselves. This quote is very important to the story because Stan will go on to perform for the identical reason. Stan falls in love with cold reads because it makes him feel superior to others. It makes him feel like a complex and unique person, while everyone else is just a basic organism who can be manipulated with ease. But before Stan commits to a career of showmanship, he receives a couple of warnings from his fellow performers. The first warning is, don't allow your tricks to evolve into destructive lies. If someone asks to communicate with loved ones, do not humor them. Tell them your game and call it a day. And perhaps even more importantly, Pete tells Stan that you can't run away from God. If you consciously sin, you will not escape the consequences. Stan's subconscious turns both warnings to ash. It also ends up quote-unquote accidentally killing Pete, a potential substitute father that felt threatening to Stan. And I do also want to touch upon the deformed fetus with a third eye that is given a tremendous amount of emphasis during the movie. The baby killed its mother during childbirth and ended up dying itself a few days later. The fetus constantly attracts Stan's attention, and I believe that's because of the parallels between them. The fetus killed its mother, Stan killed his father. Just like the geek which Stan eventually becomes, the fetus is used as a sort of curiosity that people look at in pity. During Stan's performances, he wears a blindfold that puts an eye on his forehead, the same location of the fetus's third eye. Now after Pete dies, Stan is offered an outlet for redemption in the form of Molly. She is the moral center of the film, and this is represented by her aggressively red wardrobe. Usually red is a mark for death, but in this case, I think it's more representative of Molly's vitality and true love that she has for Stan. Love that Stan can never replicate because of his inferiority complex. The relationship does endure for a couple of years as Stan becomes the Great Stanton, but things begin to fall apart when he encounters Kate Blanchett's character Lilith. It does not take long for Lilith to recognize that Stan is a con man, but when she tries to humiliate him in front of his audience, he turns the tables and humiliates her. She reaches out to Stan after the performance and pitches a scam that would fleece rich clients of hers in exchange for meeting their dead loved ones. And when Stan interacts with her, the language he uses is very bold and blunt. He talks like he could care less about her opinion of him. This is another trick he uses to repress the truth, which is, 
He cares a lot about how people perceive him. Lilith will eventually declare that she's disappointed that Stan is merely greedy, but the money is incidental to some extent. Money is a metric, a poor one in my opinion, but it is a metric, that people use to value those around them, and Stan wants to be highly valued. His final client, Ezra, tells him that money has not been enough to give him peace, and peace is what he's hoping Stan can offer. The same could be said for Stan himself. Wealth is not the solution to his deep-seated problems. And going back to Lilith for a moment, the camera work during their first scene is extraordinary. The two characters are always shifting around, and the frame will sometimes put one character above the other. It shows the battle of wits between the two characters, but also the larger war inside Stan's mind. The war to put himself above those he believes deep down are superior to himself. Stan ignores the warnings against spook shows from earlier, and he ignores Xena's cards that predict his downfall because he believes he has control over his fate. But since his subconscious is still the prime mover of his behavior, he is fatally mistaken. The lies he tells to people end up destroying everyone he comes into contact with. He rationalizes these lies by saying that they are helpful to the victims. But this thesis is destroyed by the murder-suicide of a woman, who he tells will be reunited with her dead son. Molly recognizes what these lies are doing to Stan, and once she finds a drawing of Lilith, she leaves him. She correctly tells Stan that, something is missing that you need, but it's not me. Stan pleads for her to stay, and it's in this moment of panic that his subconscious comes to light. He tells Molly that, everyone has abandoned me in my life, please don't be another one. This is the first moment where you really see the Stan who will accept being a geek. He does start drinking again with Lilith, which is a major foreshadow, but the confession to Molly shows us a man who is desperate to keep this fraudulent world intact. This world where he's a genius performer who can trick rich people and come home to a woman who will do anything for him. He uses this world to quell his inner pain, and when Molly threatens to burn that world down, he freaks out. She agrees to help him one last time, but things turn to shit, as they are always destined to. It's worth mentioning that before Ezra is killed, he confesses that he was abusive to young women, and it's this aspect of his past that has been tearing him apart inside. Characters throughout the film make confessions of this nature, and I think these moments are worth making us think about our own lives and what parts of our past we need to face down and accept. Lilith's confession is not a personal one. After Stan senses the deceit in her I love you, Stan, she confesses to him that their entire plot has been nothing more than a trick to knock him down a peg. She saw through Stan very quickly. She saw a man who was very good at tricking others, but even better at tricking himself. And his inability to see the latter half of that reality drove her crazy. To use a little wisdom from Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio, another source I didn't think I'd be using today, it's easy to fool people when they're already fooling themselves. Lilith understood this. Stan did not. And that's why she came out victorious in their war. So just as Pete tried to tell Stan, nobody can run away from God. The sins born from his subconscious had consequences. He lost everything. Molly, his career, his money, everything. And the scenes that come after his downfall are fascinating for a couple of reasons. For starters, a lot of emphasis is given to Stan's watch, which used to belong to his father. He eventually trades the watch for booze, which given the message of the final shot, makes me think that this trait is a metaphor for Stan ending the pursuit of a fraudulent life, which can mask the feelings caused by his father. Alcohol is essential to his final transformation into a geek, which is the life that matches his true beliefs about himself. And in the final shot of the movie, Stan's face almost fills the entire frame. This is because when he declares that he was born to be a geek, he is finally at one with his identity. He has finally found a life where he doesn't have to hide his feelings of inferiority, his job is literally to make people feel good about themselves. It's actually a moment of relief for Stan. In a Q&A for his new movie, I thought Guillermo del Toro said something very true. He said that everyone at one point in their life is going to figure out who they are. Someone may figure it out when they're 20. Someone else may figure it out moments before they die. But there will be a moment when you figure out who you are and what role you play in the world. The greatest tragedy of Nightmare Alley happens before the story even begins. The tragedy is that as a child, Stan didn't receive the love he deserved from his parents. His mother left him, and his father was a cold-hearted man. Childhood pain branded Stan's soul, 
and he was never able to overcome it. Stan's desperate flee from that pain causes his anguish to spread like wildfire, and because his subconscious is running the show, he never had the option of putting out the flames. Disaster was fated. The final shot of the movie is as dire a warning as it gets. We do not want to be trapped in a cage, biting the heads off of chickens. Or in modern terms, we don't want to be handcuffed by our subconscious, constantly degrading ourselves in front of the world. But to avoid that fate, we need to be conscious of our repressed pain and fears, no matter how difficult the recognition process may be. Remember to like, subscribe, and share if you enjoyed this video. And by the way, there is one image in the film, it's an ashtray with a symbol on it. For the life of me, I could not figure out what its relation to the story was. If you have an idea, leave it in the comments, I'm anxious to hear opinions. But thank you so much for stopping by, have a fantastic rest of your day, I'll talk to you soon.